Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. I know you're all very busy, as all of us are, and it's just uh, really great that you've made this a priority. And we hope that you'll have a day full of learning and collaboration and uh, have some fun in the meantime. Um, I first met Christopher a few years ago when he was brought into the organization I was working with to provide some leadership training. And like any other leadership training, I had some preconceived notions of what this was, right? How can I be a better leader? How can I make people take responsibility and be accountable? And uh, how can they be enthusiastic and engaged in their work? And all the traditional things. And so I went in with some thoughts of what that was. And I came out with what I think is one of the most influential sessions I had ever attended. And I mean that from the heart. It sounds a little cliche. But it really is true, and I've kept in touch with Christopher all these years, and when we had an opening for a morning keynote, I could think of no one better than to come and speak to the Central Ohio community about what he's learned over the past 20 years in the field research around leadership and personal responsibility, and how he's analyzed it and practiced it and, and watched people go through it and helped people go through it. So. I think you're going to find this talk really engaging, and I hope that as part of this, you find the leadership gift that you all have, and he helps you unlock it within you. So without further ado, I'd like to present Christopher Avery. Good morning. Who's awake? All right, about 6% of you. What are we going to do about the rest of you? I know. Turn to somebody on your right or left and say, I think I'll take a nap now. How about that? <laughs> How many of you are in this situation? You share responsibility with somebody else to get something done, but you're not in charge of them. They're not in charge of you, but your, <clears throat> excuse me, your performance, your reputation, your value add, your credibility. Wow, somebody else may have to give this speech. <clears throat> Depends on what you do together. How many of you are in that situation? Is anybody not in that situation? Anybody not in that situation where you share responsibility with somebody else to get something done, but they're not in charge of you, you're not in charge of them, but what you do get done depends on what you do together. One person's not in that situation. So I don't have anything to say to you this morning. <laughs> All right. um, I, I don't know actually many people who aren't in that situation and wrestle with issues of other people not stepping up to ownership the way that we would like. Um, as Joe said, I've spent the last um, 20 years, 21 years actually, as part of a research team that started five years earlier, uh, picking apart how personal responsibility works in our minds uh, and what it means to you and me in terms of performance, achievement, life, relationship, success, happiness, and satisfaction. Are you awake now? Yeah. Would, would, would you like to know more about that? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Let me also offer my appreciation first to Joe. Man, what a servant leader. All right, so thanks very much for your invitation. Thanks for staying in touch, and thanks for serving this amazing community. I don't know that there's, I do a lot of talks for agile communities. I don't know that there's a more vibrant uh, agile regional community anywhere than right here in Columbus, Ohio, from what I've been observing over the last four, five, six months as you put this together. So congratulations. And thanks, Bart, for your incredible work with me uh, to make this happen. And uh, Jennifer, congratulations on you know, a great COA board. So it's a wonderful thing. For you, again, let me add my thank you for signing up and taking a day to come here. I know this is a sellout crowd. I know it's uh, double the previous conferences. And uh, what I learned about that is that almost every former featured speaker and keynote from the last uh, years is back here today. And for me, as a speaker uh, and a consultant and a coach at, uh, in the Agile community, that's telling when speakers want to come back to a conference where they've been before. So I guess that means I'll be back here next year about this time. Yeah, I, I, hope so. <laughs> I hope so, too. Um, so thank you for knowing that you're mailbox is filling up and your messages are filling up and your boss is trying to get a hold of you and that critical build isn't working and thank you for being here and investing 
a moment of your time in exploring some new ideas and thinking about something new and different. I have another question for you. Any Buckeye fans in the room? Any Buckeyes? Any anti-Buckeyes? I'm thrilled to be back in Ohio because I grew up about three hours from here in Ashtabula, Ohio. I was uh, uh, in high school in the 70s, and what I have to say about that is some of my very best friends flunked out of Ohio State. <laughs> they, had the, they had the good uh, idea of living in Stradley uh, Hall, and um, that was kind of the end of it for them. So uh, I'm, I'm always happy to be back in Ohio, uh, and it's great to be here. So let's get to it. Um, the, the conversation that I've been dealing with for the last many years is with executives. Most of my work is two or three levels above agile teams trying to work on changing the culture of the organization so it will literally suck agile and lean principles up into the organization. And so I work with a lot of executive leadership and pretty large organizations doing culture change kind of issues. And I too, so often hear the question, should we go agile? Or we're thinking about going agile, what do you think? Or is agile for us, we're trying to decide. And my usual response is, I don't think that's the right question because agile is not a noun, it's not a thing. Right? The question is, are we exposed to change, complexity, and uncertainty in our business, in our department, in our function, in our role, in our team? And if the answer is yes, then by golly, there's some pretty amazing information coming to light over the last 10 or 20 years about how you can not only survive but thrive under conditions of change, complexity, and uncertainty. So let me ask you, are you exposed to change, complexity, and uncertainty in your role? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what I get to tell these senior executives is that there is a whole sea of young agilists that are extraordinarily disciplined and focused on value and know how to operate with sustainability and, and limiting whip and all that other stuff and, and working iteratively. And these kids, these agile experts at the age of 25, 30, 35 are ready to come take those executives' jobs if they don't also learn a similar way of thinking. So what I get to tell these executives is that by virtue of when they went to business school and got all their management training and their MBA programs or whatever, they were steeped in a way of thinking that was obsolete when they learned it. And I'm sorry that I have to tell you that, and I'm sorry that it happened, but that's the way it is. There's about a 50-year lag time in what's taught in, uh, in education in our society. And the good ideas around iterative thinking and, and Agile, which really started probably around the 70s or 80s and got fired up in the 90s and got formally named in 2001, um, most of those people were learning something called linear thinking, getting the plan right, the stuff that you all know. Uh, so before I tell you a lot about the leadership gift, what I'd like to do is share with you how I introduce um, the importance of this to uh, executives uh, who are now dealing with uh, these issues. So I also tell them it's not about processes. So I think the biggest mistake that we have going right now worldwide is seeing Agile as a process or as a set of tools. And for me, it's not at all. It's simply a way of thinking. And so for me, it's very important to figure out how to put dynamics before mechanics. And I would say about 99% of adopting organizations don't get that, don't know that, don't know how to do it, don't know how to deal with that. Um, so I call this uh, leading agile change. So let me define the terms. Uh, leading, what's leading? Well, to me, leading has nothing to do with power position or authority or status. Nothing. Leading is attitudinal. Leading is behavior. Leading is action. Leading is about assuming ownership or responsibility for some space, situation, problem, opportunity, upset, and then mobilizing action around that space. For me, that's leading. There's a fair amount of support for this as a definition, uh, and so I'm going to run with it. Agile. 
I guess the normal definition of Agile is organizing for learning and change. I think of Agile a little differently. I think of Agile as changing without changing. So I mentioned earlier that Agile is treated as a noun. True Agilists know it's not a noun at all, it's a verb. And the idea of cha to change without changing means that Agilists are really good at changing priorities, changing directions, changing focus without changing their fundamental process, their fundamental thinking process, their fundamental identity. And this is important because almost everything you read about organizational change, large-scale change, managing change, treats change as a noun. We're going to change from this to this. And the reason that there's all this resistance is because that means a change in identity, a change in a way of thinking, a change in who we are, a change in status and role. And I believe that when we adopt agile thinking, we no longer have to deal with those big types of changes because we're doing thousands of little changes all the time. So I think of agile as changing without changing. A little bit more on that. Um, I believe that the literature on managing change is seriously flawed because it's noun-based. It's based on this old linear way of thinking where first we completely identify it and put in place a big plan and then we execute it. And most of the change literature that you read is based in that way of thinking. So I've picked it apart a little bit and I've decided I want to talk at least about three types of change. The first type of change is change A or change in the abstract. Most of the generalizations that we make about change and managing change is talking about change in the abstract and it's just that, it's just talk. All change is contextual. All change is situational. All change is important because it's about what you are doing and what you're trying to accomplish. So there's got to be some other kinds of change. Change I is imposed change. It turns out that, and this is well known in the Agile crowd, is that people don't resist change. People, people resist being changed. And you and I make all kinds of changes every day as we're trying to get from A to B and there's something in our way and we reroute and go around it in order to get where we want to go. Uh, and when we learn something new, we hold on to that and we find something we've been doing for a long time that no longer suits us, we let it go. So you and I are actually quite good at changing when it suits us. It's having change imposed that's the problem. And then I talk about change C, and change C is this idea of contextual change or chosen change. And I think that when we talk about change, leading agile change, I think that we need to start talking about, are we talking about change in the abstract and all the wild generalizations that have been around for a long time? Are we talking about imposing a change? Are we talking about setting up the conditions by which we can choose changes that help us perform better and add more value? So this is the conversation that I like to have with these executives. So you're probably familiar with this type of a uh, idea. The, uh, the linear thinking notion is that there's this planning period up here in the left in gold and this execution period in the right. And I call this linear thinking. And this is what I tell executives that they've been steeped in, both in schooling and in their management programs and all their practices in their organization. And there's this schism between the culture of the organization and the way that uh, executives manage and the front lines where Agile is operating in a very different way. And in between those two, uh, I call this um, Agile ghettos because in between those two ways of operating, there's this inversion layer through which nothing can pass. No communication, no honesty, no truth, no real understanding, no real good relationships. Anybody know that inversion layer very well? Anybody? So if you know that well, you're probably uh, a project leader or a first line manager or a scrum master because we take you and you, we put you there right in that inversion layer and you're supposed to work with people on both sides of it and actually all you do is look silly to people on both sides of it. <laughs> <clears throat> so where I see true success happening across the board in organizations is when they get rid of that inversion layer by realizing that we have to get rid of this linear thinking mentality altogether. We have, to, we have to learn that the only way to deal with change, complexity, and uncertainty is through, oh, by the way, we, did you catch that little red line there? It's, it's still not done. 
the, thank you, some of you are awake and it's a dumb joke anyway. <laughs> so, the uh, complex, complex adaptive systems theory tells us that there's only one effective response to change complexity and uncertainty. And what's that response? Iteration to drive learning and discovery. That's the only effective response to change complexity and uncertainty is iteration to drive learning and discovery. So you know that this is built into your development processes, but what we don't know yet as a society is that Agile has nothing to do with software development. Agile has to do with a way of thinking about how to get things done. And so what we're trying to help executives learn is how to use the same types of thinking in order to truly get things done. So you're familiar with the idea of iterations and even nested iterations. Uh, and the big difference uh, is this, and I've introduced this idea, is that change in linear thinking mentality is a noun. It hurts. And in fact, uh, one of the best books I can recommend to you uh, in this arena is called Nameless Organizational Change by my friend Glenn Allen Meyer. And what he says is that the moment you give a change initiative a name, you create resistance that wasn't there before. So have you ever been part of a big organizational change that's been given a great name like Quality Deployment 2005 or Agile Rollout 2010 or anybody ever been there? Right. Yeah, and what Glenn says is that the moment you give a big change initiative a name, you're asking people to focus on saluting this noun, this named change initiative, instead of focus on performance and value. And no wonder people resist because they knew you should have been making these changes a long time ago because of the linear thinking process. In our way of working, change is a verb in that we're constantly inspecting and adapting and reorganizing around value and performance and priority and, and all these things that you know. And therefore, it's much easier to make a thousand or ten thousand little changes than it is to make one large change. Do you agree? Yeah. The thing is, as you know, right, most of our executives don't know this yet. They don't understand it and they think that Agile is simply about developing software. And it's not true at all, or even developing products. So that's a kind of a setup of where we're going to go. Now I want to uh, bring you greetings from the leadership gift community worldwide, the growing leadership gift community worldwide. And, and let's get into that and how it affects leading agile change. And it starts here. And that is that accountability and responsibility are not the same thing. However, accountability is the first tool of management. It's a billion dollar consulting industry to teach organizations how to drive accountability into the organization. It's the first tool of management because it's the reason for hierarchy. We have work to do that, that uh, demands more than one person, so we divide the work up into parts and we hire other people and we delegate that. And then we have a performance management process and that whole process is called the process of accountability. Do you agree? Yeah. What's interesting, and I'm, I, essentially I'm a, an applied organization science, I have a doctorate in this stuff uh, from many years ago, and what's interesting is that there's a dearth of research in management science on the practice of accountability. Management scholars avoid it like the plague. And so what's been written about accountability has mostly been written by consultants or by former executives that had an accountability performance management system that worked for them and so they think it'll work in your context. Right. Maybe true or maybe not. But accountability is outside of you. And by the way, accountability actually has very little to do specifically with management. So when I fly home later and I get to San Antonio as my home airport and I turn my car towards my home in Comfort, Texas, Anybody know Comfort, Texas? Anybody? Good, thank you. So, want to know where Comfort, Texas is? Okay. Some, some of you, I think, are waiting. Let's get on with this. Let's get to the meat. I'll tell you where Comfort, Texas is. It's nine miles from Welfare, Texas. 
<laughs> you are awake. And it's 75 miles from Utopia. And that's my metaphor for life for living in Comfort, Texas. So it's a little rural, rural town. I lived in Austin for 20 years, and this is about 90 miles west of Texas. Austin in the Texas Hill Country. So I get to go home where their people go on vacation. And so I turn my car from the airport in San Antonio out towards the countryside where I live. And there's an intersection on the interstate about 20 miles before Comfort. And it's the last place uh, to pick up real retail stuff. You know, last place where there's a real grocery store and, and things like that. And so as I leave the airport, I call my wife, say I'll be home in about an hour. And she says, great, would you stop and pick up bread, milk, and eggs? And I say, sure, sweetie, bye. And I hang up, and the radio comes back on. And man, it's a really good song. And I turn it up, and I put my car on the freeway, and I blow right past that intersection. Right? And I arrive home in comfort and pull up in front of the house. And the dogs come out, and the stars are in the sky. And the family comes out, kiss, kiss, hug, hug. How was the trip? Wonderful. How are you? Great and I'm carrying the suitcases and briefcase and everything into the house, and my wife's looking in the car. Right. And she comes and says, so where's the bread, milk, and eggs? Now at that moment, does she have the right to hold me to account? It's funny how many of you are looking at me saying, I wonder what he's going to say. Of course she has the right to hold me to account. I made a commitment. I committed. I said yes. She asked me for a favor. I said yes. I submit to you that at that moment, more important than whether she can hold me to account is how I respond. Can you imagine? Right. So being who I am, my response is most likely going to be, oh, honey, I'm so sorry I blew it. I'll go right down to the corner store and get enough of those things for breakfast and then I'll make sure I follow through tomorrow. But could you imagine a male figure, right, tired from a week on the road, arriving home late at night, being accosted with this question, where's the groceries? Could you imagine maybe a different kind of a response coming out of somebody? <laughs> not, not me. But somebody, right? So responsibility is internal, where accountability is external. Accountability is always a relationship between you and somebody else. Whether or not you are held to account isn't up to you, it's up to that other person. Right? Now the reason I know it's external is because I know that most everybody in this room and in the room over there where you're talking back at the screen, you know, the simulcast room over there, they're having a good time. <laughs> We've all been held to account for something that wasn't fair, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. And then there was that thing that you did that was in your performance plan, and you were really proud of it, and they didn't notice. They didn't hold you to account in a positive way. Right? So accountability is outside of us. It's between us and somebody else. And whether or not we're held to account isn't up to us. And it's certainly not a perfect process by any stretch of the imagination, this process of accountability. Responsibility is internal. It's a feeling of ownership. And it's subjective. Write that down. He says it's subjective. That means it's different for everybody. How much or how little of your life, your work, your situation, your problem, your upset, your failure, your challenge, how much or how little of that you're willing to own is up to you. So it's different for every one of us. And it's also transient, which means it comes and goes. So where I said I'd be the guy that says, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, I'll run right out and do that, I've also been this guy over here. Right? It's transient. Our feeling of ownership for situations comes and goes. So it's subjective, and it's transient, and it's internal. And I submit to you that far more important than accountability is responsibility, both in terms of individual success and happiness and freedom, as well as relationship success, team, culture, performance. There's a billion-dollar accountability industry out there that I mentioned. 
the more successful they are at driving accountability into an organization, what I see is the more responsibility goes down. Remember, responsibility is subjective and transient, kind of comes and goes. So let me talk to you about responsibility. It turns out that the psychology and the language of responsibility is what you and I do when things go wrong. Think about it. When things go right, we don't often stop and say, I wonder who's causing this, <laughs> right? We've been, yeah, we've been taught about being in the flow state. All the lights are turning green. Everything's happening great. All the people are showing up at the meeting. The stories are getting done. The retros are good, right? When everything's going your way, we don't stop and question. I wonder what the cause effect factor is here. But the moment something goes wrong, a pattern kicks in in our mind that's looking for reasons, right? So the language of responsibility, the psychology of responsibility is about what happens when things go wrong. So remember, I arrive home with the briefcase and the wife's looking in the car, right? And she comes to me and says, where's the bread, milk, and eggs? Now at that moment, do I have a little upset? Do I have a little problem? Something wrong at that moment? Yeah, you bet. Right? So responsibility is about how we respond when things go wrong. For how many of you do things go wrong every day? All day long. How many of you had eight or ten things go wrong already today? <laughs> and what do we have all those meetings about all day at work? Yes. Yeah. So what I want to impress on you is maybe this little pattern in our mind that I'm going to introduce you to is active every day, all day because there's not a day that goes by that not more than a few things go wrong. So it turns out that we entered this model with a problem, with something going wrong. And by a problem, I mean a uh-oh, a whoops, an upset, an oh crap. I don't mean a really juicy, fun challenge. I mean a oh, ugh. And it turns out that the first thing you and I do when something goes wrong is we have thoughts of who did this to me. Now we've been told our whole lives that we shouldn't blame. Here's what we haven't been told. If you're human, you're hardwired for it to be your very first thought every time something goes wrong. So think about it. I'm working away in my office, uh, and I have an appointment to go to, and I do one more thing too many before going. Do you ever do that? One more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Oh, crap. I reach for my keys to head to my appointment. My keys aren't there. My first thought is, who took my keys? All right. Tell me you don't do that. Right. How, do you live with a partner? Anybody live with, with a roommate, partner, spouse, somebody else, kids? Yeah. When was the last time you said, hey, have you seen my laptop, iPad, smartphone, sunglasses? Briefcase, and they say, it's right where you left it when you came in yesterday, dear. Right. So what I want to impress upon you here is that as a human being, there's a mechanism in our mind that's designed to help us cope when things go wrong. And this mechanism has a variety of steps, and we can get stuck at each step. And the lowest step in the ladder, at the bottom of the hierarchy, is lay blame. What I think's going on is there's an elegant little program Think of this as a piece of software. And it does a sort looking for an answer, a cause-effect answer. It's very logical, so technical people tend to like this. And uh, what it says at first is it does a sort, and it's looking through your contact list for somebody close to you to pin this on. <laughs> and if, if you can pin it on somebody, then you feel better. Right? So it's a kind of an ego thing at the moment. The issue is that you've been told your whole life you shouldn't do it, and the reason you shouldn't do it is it's not resourceful. It doesn't really solve a problem, and the reason it doesn't solve a problem is because what you're saying is that you're at effect and cause is somewhere else, and the premise is that your problem won't go away until somebody else changes. How many of you are good at changing other people? We're not, right? So psychologists and counselors have known this forever, and when they hear us blaming, they say, why are you giving your power away? And all that is is a cause-effect equation, saying that if the cause for my misery 
is what somebody else is doing or being or, or has, then my misery won't change until they change. That's kind of silly, is what psychologists tell us, because you're saying that the point of power is outside of you. So that's why it's not resourceful. It turns out that if you get off of this mindset, and that's all it is, it's a mindset. It's an island in our mind that we land on and we hang out there. So it's a state of mind. And I will tell you that the um, most forward-thinking research and leadership research is about mental states rather than characteristic traits. So you've read all those things about the six traits of a leader, the eight traits of the 10, the four, the all those things. All that research has been totally debunked because there's no correlation between any of those lists. Right? So those traits were contextual to that situation for that type of leader. But there's research on mental states for leadership that is showing very, very much promise. And that's why I think this is critical to the idea of leadership because it starts with self-leadership. So we can get stuck on this state of blame. And it doesn't matter how smart you are, how educated you are, what your status uh, is or your age, we are all subject to this. It's our first thought every time something goes wrong. You can get stuck there for a minute or an hour or a day or a week or a year or a lifetime or you can get off of it. And that's the second most important thing I have to say today. You can get stuck in this mental state or you can get off of it. If you get stuck there, you're absolutely sure that the cause for your misery is where? Right. Somebody else. And that they have to change for my life to get better. If you get off of it, you actually land in another mental state that's not a whole lot better. I call it justify. So this is where you've been told your whole life that you shouldn't tell stories or make excuses. And in Justify, what the program's doing here is instead of identifying a particular culprit because you've rejected the culprit, then the program looks for a set of circumstances right, that's creating this situation for you. So I reach for my keys. They're not there. I think, who took my keys? And then I do some logical reasoning for who took my keys, and I realize nobody's come in my office since I came to work. So then my next thought is, well, no wonder I can't find my keys. When I came to work this morning, I was solving a big bad problem with a colleague on the cell phone. The desk phone was ringing. I opened the door to my office, and there was a huge mess. I thought I'd been burglarized. It turns out that the branch came through the window in the storm last night and made a mess of all the papers and everything wet, blown around. A cat came in and in the plant right there. <laughs> Certainly anybody in this situation could have done what? Absolutely. See, we collude with each other. I sold it to you. Right? People right here said, yeah, lost my keys. It makes it just, take the first four letters of that word justify, it makes it just that somebody like me would have that problem as busy and important as I am and multitasking. Right? It's just the way it is. I would have this problem. The issue is that I'm still at effect and the cause is where? Now it's a set of circumstances beyond my control. My ego feels better because now it has a way of coping with having this problem, but it is, a, is it a powerful place from which to solve the problem? It's not because the premise is that until the situation changes, what? My problem's not going to go away. So want to know what the number one multi-billion dollar justify is that I deal with in most of my client cultures? You don't? That's just the way it is around here. That's just the way it is at this company. That's the way management has always been. That's the way they'll always be. And then we stick the premise on the end. Therefore, there's Nothing you can do about it. So let me ask you a question. How many of you are skilled in Scrum? Skilled in Scrum? Does Scrum have this little thing in there about identifying impediments in case you want to confront them and do something about it. Is that culture an impediment? 
Yeah, and so what are we going to do about it as long as our premise is that it's beyond our control? Right? So another one of those management fallacies is we've been taught to focus on what you have control of and go out and get authority and responsibility if you want to change something. Well, good luck with that. I don't think that's how it rolls. So this is a multi-billion dollar problem. And it's just a simple mental state that we get stuck in when we have upsets, when we have things not going right, when we wish things were different. And we're able to say it's because of that set of forces beyond my control. Um, years ago, I saw the, there's a guy who's a pretty famous author, wealth guru named Robert Kiyosaki. And years and years and years ago, I saw him say something that I thought was pretty arrogant at the time. He said, I make my, all my best business moves in a down economy. And he says, it's not because I'm counter-cyclical investor. It's because my competition dries up. Because my competition assumes that they have to wait for what? Come on. They have to wait for the economy to turn around before they can do business. Kiyosaki says, I look around. He says, I'm still spending money. You still spending money? You still spending money? He says, I figure out there's deals to be made, and it's much easier in a down economy because everybody else is justifying that they have to wait for things to change before they can have what they want. So this is a huge, very important mental state to understand and to be able to see. Right? Now, if you've been out of work for two or three years because of a poor economy, I don't want to sit here and make you feel bad about that, but you might want to look at, are you allowing an assumption to stop you from doing something in order to move forward? Because when we get off of justify, essentially what we're doing in our mind is we're saying, I'm not willing to have the environment have power over me. I'm not willing to blame my problem on the environment. Then the next thing that happens is we start to feel bad. <clears throat> And this is the language of, I'm so stupid. I'm such a dolt. How could I be so dumb? God, will I never learn? Oh, shoot me. How many of you know this language? <clears throat> I actually know the answer. I only saw about 20% uh, of the hands go up. I know the answer. I know how many of you know this language. I've done the research. This is hardwired into us. It's the next step in the responsibility process when we get off of justify then what this little program does is it seems to say, well, I've tried to let you off the hook with a culprit and with a set of circumstances. If you're not going to buy those, then you're not buying any external causality. So now, not only are you at effect, but it must be you at cause. Oh, I did this. Right. Oh, I did this. So now, not only do I see myself at, at effect of having this problem, but I see that somehow I contributed to it. I did it to myself. So naturally, we have this self-talk of I'm a dummy, I'm adult, I'm so stupid, shoot me, my bad, uh, et cetera. The issue is that when we're doing that, there's this premise. Right? So remember in Blame and Justify, there, were pre there was a premise. And that premise, no matter how smart we are, how experienced we are, how educated we are, how savvy we are, we buy that premise and we completely get stuck in that place. The same happens in shame. And the premise is, I'm not cut of the right cloth. I don't have what it takes. I'm lacking some resourcefulness. I don't have the right degree. I don't have the right looks. I don't have the right color hair. I don't have the right intelligence factor. I don't, I'm missing something. That's the premise. And when we buy that premise, then we stop trying to solve that problem in a unique way. Now, there's something interesting about shame, and the reason it's a different color here is because this is the first place where society taught me growing up that if I'm doing this, I'm taking responsibility. And I no longer think so. And the reason I no longer think so is because I know that true ownership, true responsibility, is the place of freedom, choice, and power in my mind. It is the place of happiness and success and problem-solving performance and resourcefulness. And if my assumption is I'm lacking something, and that assumption stops me, then I'm not really solving the problem. I'm just coping with the anxiety at that moment. So I'm going to climb down here 
and actually see if I can demonstrate with this, this to you. So you go to that after action review meeting, that one that's dealing with the big kind of uh-oh, failure. And the person stands up in the meeting and says, that was my fault, blame me, I did it, I'll take the hit, I've got broad shoulders. And at the meeting, you're sitting there, and the first thing you do is you go, <laughs> because of that single point accountability thing, right, that we've all been taught. So if we have a scapegoat, the second thing we do is we go, oh, good boy, he's taking what? Responsibility. Now, same situation, different point in time, different group. Right? That's my mistake. I did that. Whoa, man, that was a big mistake, too. Jeez, can you believe I did that? Gosh. Now, here's when we caught it. Here's what we did immediately to correct. Here's what we've learned since then about why I would make much of such a mistake. Here's what we've done to try and clean it up with those people that suffered from our mistake. And now I'm standing in front of you to find out what other amends we need to make in order to fully recover from this. Now, you tell me which one is ownership? Which one is responsibility, this one or this one? Yeah, this one, it's clear to us, right? We really know it when we see it. So why are we rewarding this behavior? For me, once I learned this, once I learned this mental pattern of the responsibility process, I realized that society taught me that if I was beating myself up, I'm being responsible. I no longer believe that at all. And in fact, as a father now of a 20-year-old and a 15-year-old, and I've been doing this research 20 years, I remember the day that I realized I never want to operate from shaming as a way to try and get some kind of performance change. Because you may get performance change, I doubt it'll be resourceful. And the reason is that there's lots of anxiety and shame, and so it can cause action, but it comes along with a premise that I'm lacking something. Right? And so it's not truly resourceful. So this is a pseudo type of responsibility. When we quit beating ourselves up, then we land in another place. This is starting to get a little monotonous. And this place is called obligation. And the mindset of obligation is the mindset of have to, don't want to have to, don't want to. It's the mindset of have to, don't want to. So if you're wondering if you have some of this mindset, how many of you have to go to some really, really, really dumb meeting? Not this one. <laughs> have to go. How many of you, tell the truth, how many have to go to really stupid, dumb, stultifyingly boring, horrible, valueless meeting? Have to go. I ask you, why do you go? Have to. Don't want to. Have to. Oh, we call ourselves civilized. How many of you have to do some really stupid paperwork? How many of you have to go to some kids' event for church, school, community, sports? <clears throat> we say to our buds, I'd really like to go grab a beer, but I have this kid thing I have to do. How many of you have to go to your in-laws for holiday? <laughs> Anybody have to go to your in-laws for holiday? Yeah. So some people say, but op isn't obligation, isn't that responsibility? Isn't it good to follow through on your commitments to do what you're supposed to do? Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about the research. Guess what the level of performance is out of you and me when we're operating in this mental state of obligation? You might want to write this down. Barely adequate to get a pass. <laughs> Just enough is our level of performance when the mindset of obligation. Think about it. When you go to that really stupid, stultifyingly boring meeting, are you in the now? Are you fully present and aware, ready to engage? Of course not. That would be insane. If you were fully in the now and present at that moment, you'd have to say, uh, excuse me, this is a really stupid meeting. Could we do something different? <laughs> so you're not in the now. You're not present. Instead, you're paying attention to the minimum 
necessary to get done and move on. It's one of the reasons we have so many middling teams, which uh, I talk about in the Teamwork as an Individual Skill book, which uh, is how I got into this, was I was trying to figure out how to teach smart software project leaders how to build teams. And uh, I decided that when teams performed highly, it was because the people on that team stepped up to, subjective, subjectively stepped up to something larger than themselves and felt a kinship with the other people. And so I wanted to figure out what this responsibility was that people step up to and how can I teach it to other software project leaders. And so I went on a search for understanding it and that's when I found this research that started in 1987. And so it became the core philosophy of this team building framework uh, that I've used. And let me just read you a bit here. It says, have you noticed that people who face what they don't like about their lives with denial, blame, or justification get to keep things that way? Such people assign the cause of their problems to others by saying it's not my fault. They box themselves in. Many conflicts at work are caused by two people, departments, or organizations seeing the other party as the cause of their misery with no way out. The reward for this choice of behavior is that they get to stay in their misery. I prefer to team with people who believe that they create all of their lives results, good, bad, big, and small. With such a belief, there's only one person who can change what isn't working oneself. The difference is a simple switch of mindset. Agree to internalize the cause of your results rather than externalize. From that position, you need not stay in any undesirable condition. When we adopt this switch, we become more willing and able to respond to life and team situations, becoming consistently more willing and able to respond, i.e. responsibility, to whatever happens in your life and work is the key to personal power and growth. It's also the key to productive relationships. Um, so I hope that you have, in your life, been on a very high-performing team. I found out that when teams perform highly, there's three things that consistently appear in the literature over the last 70 years since the team building industry started. And the three things are that people went beyond what they were asked to do. So speaking of accountability and responsibility, right, was that true for you when you've been on a high performance team? Did people on that team go beyond what you were asked to do? Yeah. Amazing, how many managers wouldn't love to figure out how to get people to go beyond what they're asked to do? I tell you, the more you drive accountability, the less that's probably going to happen. The second thing from the research on high performance teams is that there is high performance. You are very productive. You added tremendous value. The project was very successful or the initiative. Is that true? Okay, so that makes sense. We go beyond what we're asked to do, and we have high performance. And here's the third thing, the real kicker. We had a great time doing it. The work itself was its own reward. Right. Now, how many managers wouldn't love to figure out how to have all three of those things over and over and over, yet we're focusing on holding people to account rather than creating cultures where people step up to take ownership? The, I mentioned that Justify was a uh, multi-billion dollar problem. Cultures of shame and obligation is the trillion dollar problem worldwide that I have set out to solve over the last six or eight years when I really dedicated myself to this work. What you're trying to do in creating happy, free workplaces is you're trying to get people out of the mindset of shame and obligation where they can move to this resourceful place in our minds called responsibility. It turns out that responsibility is just a mental state that we get to every now and then around challenges. So remember, it's subjective and it's transient. How much or how little of your reality you take ownership of is up to you. The more of your reality that you decide to take ownership of, the faster you'll grow, the happier you'll be. The less of your reality, the more you think that, that reality is out there hammering on you, I think the less successful, the less happy you will be. So the more we get to this mental state, the more we can truly solve problems. Now, is this just about hairy-fairy, you know, touchy-feely stuff? I don't think so. 
because what I believe is that logical cause-effect thinking in these mental states below the line is very simplistic. It's what we would call single-loop learning, to use the language of Chris Argerus in single and double-loop learning. Chris Argerus is a famous industrial psychologist that's often quoted in the Agile community. Um, when we cross over from obligation to responsibility in this mental state, what happens is I think we open up far more complex reasoning processes. And in order for that to happen, we actually have to expand our awareness, expand our perception, which means we're able to see things more clearly. And we see paths to success or paths to moving forward or paths to production, productive action that we could not see when we're in mental states that's saying I'm at cause or I'm at effect and cause is out there or I suck or I'm trapped. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about the, um, the logic of shame. The logic of shame is this. You and I were not born with perfect knowledge. Agreed? Yeah. We're not going to die with it either, by the way. So how do, we, how do we learn? We learn through trial and error, don't we? And so what's the likelihood that you would make a decision or take an action 10 years ago or 10 months ago or 10 weeks ago or 10 minutes ago that you thought was a really good thing at the time to do and today you wish you could have it back? Today you wish you knew then what you know now? What's the likelihood of that happening? 100%. Yes? And what's the likelihood of that happening day after day after day for the rest of your life? It's 100%, right? So with amazing frequency, you're going to be able to revisit decisions and actions that you took in the past and wished you hadn't done that. Now, for how long do you deserve to beat yourself up for being human? When, if you could get off of that, you can actually get closer to getting the lesson, to figuring out how to not repeat that in the future. So a lot of people ask me, Christopher, have you no shame? And I say, I've got a ton of it. I've got far more than I wish I had. But the longer I wallow in it, the less I grow, the longer it takes me to figure things out. So I want to get off of it as rapidly as possible. And the way I get off of it is I forgive myself for being what? Human. And having to learn through life by trial and error, and having the memory of being able to revisit decisions or actions that I took in the past. The logic of obligation is this. What's really interests me is how you and I get into this trapped mindset set and how much we value skill sets and IQ, SAT scores, performance ratings, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't change the fact that you're wired this way. It's in our DNA. And and this is what happens to us. So what's the, what's the logic of obligation? The logic of obligation is this. Have you been making your own decisions for more than three to five years? Then who's the architect of your reality? That's the logic, right? So when I think I'm trapped, when I think it's out there, Right? I realize that I've created these filters, I've created these assumptions, I've created the way I look at the world, I've created the, the decisions to be in the role that I'm in, the place that I'm in, therefore if there's something about this that I don't like or I feel trapped, it's up to whom to change it? Yeah, it's up to me. You look like I'm, am I depressing you? <laughs> Maybe you just went to sleep again. It turns out that obligation is the one that I really want you to understand because shame and obligation is where I've found professionals like you and I live uh, in the corporate world. And what I really want you to understand is that if I say I have to go to the stupid meeting, I've flipped the switch on handling the anxiety, I've decided I'm coping, um, and I believe that I'm trapped and there's nothing that I can do. But if instead I say, you know what? I get to go to this really stupid meeting because I don't know how to change it yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> then what happens is I'm not buying the premise. I'm not buying the premise that I'm trapped. 
I'm just simply saying, you know what, at the moment I have multiple choices. I kind of like to keep my job, so the choice I'm making is to go to the stupid meeting. But I'm assigning to my mind to please start working on this issue for me. And when you have a couple of answers or new solutions, let me know. And the reason is that I know that only when you refuse to adopt the premise does your mind start working in more complex reasoning ways and looking for new solutions and expanding its ability to handle anything. So while it may be a little bit too confronting to say, I get to go to this really stupid meeting, what I want you to learn is how valuable it is to acknowledge to yourself that you're the architect of the reality that you're seeing. And the only way to change that is to not feel trapped, but to know that you're going to discover something new soon. So a couple of other positions to understand. Quit is when we disengage. So remember when I said you can't be in the now at that dumb meeting? That's quit. It would be insane to show up and be present, so instead we check out, we disengage, we move our bodies to that place, or we dial in so that they see that we're on the call. And then we roll our own home movies or multitask or whatever. That's quit, just mentally quitting, mentally disengaging. It's escaping without solving the problem, which means the problem's going to come back over and over and over and over again until you really figure out how to get it. Uh, the issue is that there's absolutely no growth or learning below this line. And the only place for growth and learning is when we move from obligation to responsibility. I call this the responsibility process. Um, and if you're interested, there's a nice little PDF poster that you can download from ChristopherAvery.com. And you can print as many copies as you like and hang it up. I recently got an email from a guidance counselor in uh, Plano, Texas, whose husband had been in an audience that I was in, and he introduced her to this, and she downloaded the PDF, and she said, I've hung 150 copies all over campus. <laughs> and uh, you can do that, too, uh, if you think that this is valuable to you and that you'd like a reminder. So most people, when they're introduced to the responsibility process, they want to know what to do about it. Are you thinking? I wonder what to do about this. First of all, the question is, do I have one of these operating in me? And if you're saying, yeah, I think maybe I do. And if you say, no, I don't think so, but damn, all those people around me, they sure do. <laughs> then you probably have one too, I'm guessing. Then people want to know what to do about it. And here's what we've learned about what to do about it. There are three keys to responsibility. So what I call the leadership gift is comprised of this research on the responsibility process, how our minds respond when things go wrong, big or small, every day, all day long. And the keys, which is how to work with this. So we see this as the interface between your inner and outer reality. And the keys are, are what you do, the tool set that you have for interacting with this. And the keys are intention, awareness, and confront. So let me tell you quickly about each of these keys. The intention key. The intention key says, however you create deep abiding commitments in your life, however you create first principles, prime directives, core values, however you create those, however you create your most profound desires, you might want to think about creating one that says that I want to get to the top of this responsibility chart around every upset every day for the rest of my life. That's the intention key. So intention is a huge study. It's a study of free will. Uh, in the work that I do, we go deep into understanding free will, needs, wants, desires. We define a win as an intention met, so we score and share wins in our lives. Win doesn't mean somebody else lost. Win meant I set an intention. It happened. That's a win. How many of you want to be on winning teams? Yeah, so do you know what winning is for each other? You might want to think about that. Because the more we celebrate wins, the more we tap into our ability to use one of our most core skills or abilities as a human, which is to set an intention and achieve it or meet it. So while it's a deep study, the way to start practicing intention as a key to responsibility is straightforward intend to get to the top of that chart around every upset, period. 
I believe that this was set for me in 1991 when I was first introduced to this research. The research team only had three positions on the chart, blame, justify, and responsibility. The other positions had not been teased out of the research yet. And uh, I sat there where you're sitting and was being introduced to this by these members of the research team, and I already had a doctorate in organizational science, tons of psychology background, tons of communication background. And I'm sitting there with my jaw hanging down to my chest saying, man, that is the most profound model of normal psychology I've ever seen. And I thought to myself, I want that. I want that for myself. And the reason I want that for myself is because I'm a fairly ambitious, fairly bright person. And damn, how much time I spend in blame and justify. What if I could spend less time there, 10% less time? 5% less time, and add that time to the responsibility mindset, how much more able would I be? And I sat there right where you're sitting and went, damn, I want that. So I think I set my intention at that moment. It's probably why I've become the person on the research team most associated with this research uh, around the world. So that's intention, first key. Why is it the first key? Without it, the other two keys don't matter, right? Yeah. So the second key is awareness. Just like intention, awareness is a huge study of the mind, consciousness, mindfulness, right? attention, focus, clarity, confusion. So awareness can be a, a, lifelong, a lifelong pursuit. And we go deep into it in the work that we do. But when it comes to applying the keys to responsibility, Awareness is very simple, very straightforward, and that is just become more and more aware of what you're thinking and what you're feeling when you are blaming, when you're in justify, when you're in shame, when you're in obligation, when you're in quit, and when you're in responsibility. The first two keys work great together because if you can catch yourself blaming, and so often when I speak, Right, immediately afterwards, people, and this will happen today probably as you go throughout your sessions, people say, oh, that was a justify. They catch themselves. And then, of course, the next thing is they feel kind of sheepish because shame is what comes after when you graduate off of justify. But if you can catch yourself, that's actually worth celebrating rather than feeling bad about. Because if you can catch yourself blaming and you have an intention to be up here, your psyche colludes with you to stop blaming, and it knocks you up to the next island. The next thing that happens is you're making up some story. And if you can catch yourself telling a story, and you have an intention to be at responsibility, then it knocks you off of that, and the next thing you know, you're feeling bad. And it's not that I want you to feel bad, but I want you to know what feeling bad about putting yourself in that situation. I want you to know what it means. It just means that you're processing through your ownership of this reality, and you can either get stuck there, or you can forgive yourself because I want to take ownership, I want to get the lesson. And the next thing you know is you're feeling trapped. You know, Crap, what can I do? I can't do anything. Right. And if you can recognize yourself that I'm in the mindset of obligation, then you can start perturbating, perturb, perturbate, to, to poke, to provoke, to perturb your mind, to look for a new solution. So the Meg Wheatley, the lady who wrote Leadership in the New Science, in a book called A Simpler Way, she said, we cannot change living systems. All we can do is provoke them. All we can do is provoke them and see how they respond, and then we inspect and adapt, and we provoke some more and see how they respond, and we provoke some more. So I use the term perturbation. To perturbate the mind comes from Ilya Prigogine's um, laws of dissipative structure that says under pressure, that systems will uh, rearrange into more complex structures. So what I've been telling you about intention and awareness and about refusing to operate an obligation is to start perturbating, to start putting pressure on your own mind to look for new answers or solutions, because if you don't, it's never going to happen. But that's where the reordering occurs to higher levels of complexity, which makes you greater uh, ability to handle uh, anything. So the intention and awareness together is really fabulous to move you up the chart. And if you want to take one exercise from this back to your team, take this exercise. Take this poster. The teaching points are on the back so that you can very quickly introduce your team to this responsibility process. And then put five flip charts on the wall, five or six, 
or divide up the whiteboard and write lay blame, justify, shame, obligation, quit, responsibility, and then give the team 100 points or 1,000 points or a million points for every phrase they come up with of how we as a team blame the suppliers, the customers, the other departments, the other teams, right? how we justify, how we beat ourselves up, and fill up these charts with it, create a game out of it, make it fun, because when you expose it, it's always fun. It's worth laughing at. And what's going to happen then is in the future, when those phrases come up, you're going to be far more aware. Right? This could be a million dollar exercise for you and your teams. Because every individual, every role, every title, every function, every department, every company has their own private language about how they collude to cope instead of to actually grow. Uh, and I'll tell a story on uh, a company that I did a lot of work with back in the 90s, and I won't mention them because I don't want to make anything specific about them. And they since have discovered this, and they've closed this little loophole. But there was a phrase that you could invoke in this big company anytime there was a failure, and you'd get a get out of jail free card. And the phrase was, my dependencies did not deliver. You could go into an after action review for a failed multi million dollar project, and you would go through all your slide deck and say, I can show you that I absolutely came through on everything that I had control over, and the reason that this sucker is such a big failure is because the, the dependencies didn't deliver. And they would actually say, Oh, you poor baby, here's your bonus, here's your title, here's your promotion. <laughs> now, you're laughing at that, and I want you to discover the same phrases that you use with your team and in your role and in your organization that are also going to be just as laughable after you realize it, because they're there. And every time I work with the team, we discover a bunch of them, didn't we, Joe? <laughs> yeah. In the workshop the other day. The third key is confront. The confront key says, that we actually have to be willing to look in the mirror and ask ourselves if we want to own this reality, and if so, what is there to see or get or learn or do? So it turns out that confront, I don't mean confrontation, I don't mean getting in other people's face, I mean getting in our own face. So confront just means the ability to face, and it turns out that just like we're hardwired to both avoid responsibility and to take responsibility through this responsibility process, as human beings, we're both incredibly weak at our ability to face scary things, things that we don't already have the answer for. We're incredibly weak. We can also be incredibly strong. So when I was 10 years old and my friend Mikey and I in Ashtabula made little snowballs at the end of one day and just before we went home for dinner, we got the hose from his parents' house and we sprinkled them so that they'd turn into ice overnight. And the next day after school, we came and we went to that little fort, and it was right next to a little secondary highway, and there was a little tree, and we'd hide in the fort and toss those ice balls out and see if we could hit a car going by on the highway. And I did. <laughs> and it was the front windshield, and it was ice. Now, at that moment, I had the opportunity to run away or to face it, to stand in the heat to turn towards the struggle, to turn towards the challenge. That's what confront is. Confront is that choice and knowing that only by facing will you actually grow in any way. I won't tell you what I did. <laughs> so this is your leadership gift. It's your leadership gift because you were born with it. Everybody is. Every act of leadership taps into it. Every act of leadership, because leadership faces the anxiety of the moment and figures out how to respond resourcefully. And leadership starts with self-leadership. I am really sick and tired of leadership being about persuasion and influence. It's why we're asking for more authentic leaders, true leaders, real leaders, servant leaders today. It's because 95% of leadership for me is self-leadership. And if you step up to this level of self-leadership, then you're going to find people wanting to come assist you, follow you very well. So we're born with it. Every act of leadership taps into it. Most people never know they have this in them. Some of you didn't know it before the last hour. 
And now, not only do we know that we have this in us, but with the research of the last 25 years, we know exactly how to understand it, how to teach it, how to take it, and even how to practice and master it. So we've opened the leadership gift for you. The question is, what are you going to do with it? It's your onboard guidance system. I'll skip Charles Darwin. You know what he said. Here's some metaphors. We can grow or cope. We can learn or defend. We can change or resist. We can be agile or we can be stiff. We can focus on value or we can focus on waste. We want people to be motivated when they're resigned. So I have a friend, some of you may know Sergey, he's in Oslo, works a lot in Russia as an agile coach. He's taking my work into Russia and, and I was there recently with him and he said without responsibility and trust, no process will work. It doesn't matter what process you're using. Right? He said, agile practices efficiently expose problems. The leadership gift gives people tools to address problems. I submit to you that if agile is all about applying empirical process, then you've got an onboard empirical process that's probably the most important one to tap into. And that's your ability to grow and learn uh, from problems. I tell executives about some papers, some, some books worth reading. I think I'm going to skip that so we can get to some Q&A. I tell them to replace right and wrong with empiricism, to replace endless analysis with experiments, and most importantly, I tell them to ask themselves how they know whether or not they're adding value. Uh, and that there are hundreds of young disciplined agilists who'd be happy to come help them uh, look at that and, and answer the question. So these slides are available at ChristopherAvery.com in my presentation archive, and uh, I invite you to go get them if you'd like. And I think we have a few minutes for some questions, do we, Bart? Yes. So what do you think? Awesome. <laughs> do we have a question? Raise your hand. Question, comment, insight. Yes, sir. Sp just yell it out. Sure. Could you? Just quickly go back to the slide that has the books and just speak for a minute about the books that you would recommend. Sure. So again, this is talking to executives about how if they don't want to learn what we all are learning, you're going to come replace them pretty soon. Uh, what I tell them is that um, the Agile is not specifically about software because there's a phenomenal of uh, lightweight strategic management framework that this guy's got the largest entrepreneurial management training organization in the world, Vern Harnish. I recommend you get on his, on his weekly email newsletter. If you're not, it's the only weekly email newsletter I get that I read word for word. And the Rockefeller Habits, he tells a story that's just Scrum, although he didn't know it was Scrum because he invented it from complex adaptive systems. And the, the, the framework that he, uh, uh, is teaching is called rhythm. So what I tell executives is, if you think Agile's about software development, here's a strategic management framework that uses exactly the same dynamics. On the other end is uh, there's a little consulting firm in uh, Stanford, Connecticut called Schaefer Consulting that for 50 years has been building what I believe is the most powerful, most successful large-scale organizational change approach available, and it's called rapid results. And what they do is they say, instead of doing a $5 million study, for instance, if you think you need to revamp your entire inventory control process, instead of doing that, why don't we get a few determined people and create a 100-day project and see if we can get one category of your inventory or even one product working the way you want it to work and then take the learning from that and apply it to more and from that to more to that to more. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like Agile or Scrum, doesn't it? So um, I work with these guys on occasion and uh, Robert Schaefer still comes to work every day. He's 84 years old, uh, walks a little stooped over, got a big white caterpillar mustache and uh, I think his work on large scale organizational change is brilliant and it's just what you and I know as Agile. So I've been telling you is these things have been growing now since the 1970s or 80s. Um, another good popular read today is the Lean Startup with Eric Ries, uh, which pr 
probably maybe the most familiar book uh, on this list to you. Nameless Organizational Change, my friend Glenn Allen Meyer. Uh, of course, we have to start, if we want people to operate at responsibility and get out of shame and obligation, we have to build environments that support that. And so that's why understanding the motivation work of Daniel Pink and what people really strive for uh, at work is important. And this book in the middle is a really fabulous book. I really recommend it. Um, it's in good company. And like I said, this is on my website. You can download it. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks. Excellent, excellent presentation. I think everybody's had a blast. Um, can you uh, just draw some of the connections between the change part of, of your uh, presentation at the beginning and the responsibility ladder uh, that, you know, at the end? Absolutely. Uh, I would say this, change is a verb. The responsibility process is something that's operating in you every day, all day long. All right, so if you get stuck in any one place, you're not going to change. So resistance is below the line, change is above the line. What I've found is that, uh, thank you for asking me to make the connection. If I didn't say this before, I'll say it now. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was in the workforce left the workforce, went back to graduate school. I was one of those pain in the ass graduate students that ask real live questions um, instead of just nodding my head about the theory. And uh, when um, I made the decision to not become a professor and a scholar, but I wanted to go back and be an applied leadership uh, scientist in the workplace, I wanted to, to find and pursue fundamental solutions to persisting problems. And um, you know, I never knew that a few years later I would run into something that would become the most important information I know and have to share. Because this is at the root of every problem that I see in organizations of not solving a problem, not learning, not growing, not performing, not producing, not changing. Yeah, so does, does that make the connection for you? I think it does. Thank you. Yeah, one more. Uh, you Um, you give your talk, thank you for the presentation. Um, you give this, uh, your conversation to um, executives, uh, is what you said. Many executives, from, from my experience, believe that their value add is in command and control and in getting uh, metrics in order to, to use those metrics in order to do command and control. What do you tell them that their actual value add is <laughs> if it's not that? I mean, I, do you believe that is that? I would imagine that you don't believe that is that. No, I don't believe that it's that. Um, what, what I tell them is that, my, first of all, I don't tell them that I have the answer. So I don't believe that any organizational scientist designer can come up with the right design. Uh, Lean has taught us that we can only come up with the right design for anything through inspecting and adapting. Right, starting, at, starting with our best baseline and then inspecting and adapting. So what I would suggest to them is that they start learning a little philosophy called servant leadership uh, and that they uh, think about um, how to continuously uh, inspect and adapt the value stream of executing this company in the same way we're inspecting and adapting other value streams. Um, so that's, you know, that's my best answer to you at the moment. I don't know if that's satisfactory, but I'll be around almost all day, and I'll be happy to think a little bit more about this after I've had some more caffeine and come back at you again. <laughs> all right. So hey, thanks for uh, a great time this morning. Again, on behalf of the worldwide growing leadership gift community, which I hope you will think about becoming a part of at some time, thank you very much. I had a blast. <laughs>